God's warning unheeded. This quarter's lesson study is a timely reminder of where we are as it relates to the second coming of Jesus. And I want to use this story of Nebuchadnezzar as a lesson for us as believers. I want to talk about God's forbearance, his long-suffering, his mercy with us. But that wouldn't last forever. And that's the lesson I want us to take away today. Probation will end. Jesus will finish his work in the sanctuary in heaven. And at that time, probation will be closed. And the announcement will be made. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. The time of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, this was the second dream he had. Nebuchadnezzar had accomplished quite a lot. All his military enterprises were successful. He had subdued Assyria, Phoenicia, Judea, Egypt, Arabia. These great conquests probably betrayed him into vanity and self-confidence and pride. Those are some of the faults, even as believers, we indulge in. We may have experienced success in achieving goals and objectives, or maybe we have acquired wealth, and we begin to feel that it was due to our abilities, our know-how, just as God had warned the Israelites prior to going into the promised land. He said, you will be tempted after you get there and you build houses and you're prospering to think that you've done it on your own. So, at this time, Nebuchadnezzar is feeling secure. When he felt most secure, when it was most unlikely that anything would occur to disturb his self-complacency, his tranquility, it was at this time that God chose to trouble the king with fears forebodings taken from prophet and kings. God had shown himself to Nebuchadnezzar on previous occasions. We go back to chapter 1 in Daniel and we find Daniel and his friends choosing to eat the simple foods rather than those from the king's table. And after ten days, they looked better, were smarter, wiser, than those who ate from the king's table. And then we have the dream of the image, the head of gold. God is telling Nebuchadnezzar, what will happen? 
and the king tries to reinterpret the dream. He builds an entire image of gold, thinking that his kingdom would last forever. In chapter 3, the three Hebrew boys are thrown into the fiery furnace because they disobeyed the king. Only to see Jesus with them in the furnace, cooling the furnace with his presence. And finally, in chapter 4, God gives the king another dream. Another opportunity to acknowledge the God of heaven. The king is troubled by this dream. But the question should be asked, what could strike fear into the heart of such a king as Nebuchadnezzar? He had been a warrior from his youth. He had faced the perils of battle and terrors of slaughter before, carnage, and he had never been afraid. Why now? No enemy had threatened him. There was no hostile cloud visible. God used his own thoughts and visions to teach him what nothing else could. A valuable lesson of dependence and humility. The spirit of prophecy tells us that he who had terrified others, but whom no other could terrify, was made a terror to himself. And still we find greater humiliation than that narrated in the second chapter you remember the magicians that were brought in not only to explain the dream but to tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was all about that was the first dream the dream of the image and of course they could not tell him what the dream was but they had boasted that if they knew what the dream was they could give him the interpretation and so they had the opportunity Second time around, Nebuchadnezzar remembers the dream. So he brings in his magicians, soothsayers, to tell him what it all meant. However, on this occasion, even though the king had remembered the dream and related it to them, his magicians shamefully and dishonorably failed him again. <coughs> they could not make known the interpretation, and once again the king turned to the prophet of God, Daniel. In this dream, the reign of Nebuchadnezzar is symbolized by a tree in the midst of the earth. Babylon, the city where Nebuchadnezzar reigned, was approximately in the center of the then known world. The tree reached into heaven, and the leaves of the tree were fair. Its external glory and splendor were great. Its fruit was abundant, and it had food for all. The beasts of the field rested under the shade of the tree, and the fowls of heaven dwelt in its branches. What could more plainly and forcibly represent the fact that Nebuchadnezzar ruled his kingdom in such a way as to afford the fullest protection, support, and prosperity to all his subjects? And when the order was given that this tree should be cut down, it was commanded that the stump should be left in the earth. It was to be protected with a band of iron and brass that it might not decay, but that the source of future growth and greatness might be left. In 
we know that Nebuchadnezzar, the decree was for seven years. He was to be an animal. Seven years. There's an interesting quote here from King, uh, Prophet and Kings. What an interest. The holy ones or angels take in human affairs. They see, as mortals never can, how unseemly a thing is pride in the human heart. As ministers of God, they cheerfully execute his decrees in the correction of evil. Man must know that he is not the architect of his own fortune. For there is one who rules in the kingdom of men on whom his dependence should be humbly placed. A man may be, uh, be a successful ruler, but he should not pride himself upon that. For unless God had permitted him to rule, he would never have reached this position of honor and power. For a time, Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the, the supremacy of the true God. He appealed to Daniel to solve the mystery. Thou art able, he said, for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Nebuchadnezzar here again used his accustomed way of mentioning gods in the plural, though the Septuagint renders the phrase, the Holy Spirit of God is in you. Exalted to the pinnacle of worldly honor and acknowledged even by inspiration as the king of kings, Nebuchadnezzar nevertheless at times ascribed to the favor of Jehovah the glory of his kingdom and the splendor of his reign. Such had been the case after his dream of the great image. His mind had been profoundly influenced by this vision and by the thought that the Babylonian Empire, universal though it was, was finally to fall and other kingdoms were to follow until at last or all earthly powers were to be superseded by a kingdom set up by the God of heaven, which kingdom was never to be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar's noble conception of God's purpose concerning the nations was lost sight of later in his experience. Yet when his proud spirit was humbled before the multitude on the plain of Dura, he once more had acknowledged that God's kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Nebuchadnezzar was a heathen, an idolater, leading an idolatrous nation. Nevertheless, God used him as an instrument for the punishment of the people of Judea. That's how the people of Judea ended up in Babylon. Therefore, behold, I will bring strangers, Babylonians, upon you, the most ruthless and violent of the nations, and they will draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor was given Nebuchadnezzar after years of patient and wearing labor. He had conquered Tyre and Egypt. And as he had added nation after nation to the Babylonian realm, he added more and more to his fame as the greatest ruler of the age. We're talking about God's forbearance God's mercy. It is not surprising that the successful monarch, so ambitious and so proud spirited, should be tempted to turn aside from the path of humility, which alone leads to true greatness. 
Jesus says, he who is greatest, let him be a servant. That's true humility. In the intervals between his wars of conquest, he gave much thought to the strengthening and beautifying of his capital, until at length the city of Babylon became the chief glory of his kingdom, the golden city, the praise of the whole earth. His passion as a builder and his signal success in making Babylon one of the wonders of the world aided his pride until he was in grave danger of spoiling his record as a wise ruler whom God could continue to use as an instrument for the carrying out of the divine purpose. So, in mercy, God gave Nebuchadnezzar another dream to warn him of his peril and of the snare that had been laid for his ruin. So Nebuchadnezzar is greatly troubled by the dream which his wise men could not Interpret, once more, in this idolatrous nation, once more, God is speaking to Nebuchadnezzar. Testimony was being given to the fact that only those who love and fear God can understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. The king, in his per perplexity, sent for his servant Daniel, a man esteemed for his integrity and for his unrivaled wisdom. So we find Daniel is summoned, king's palace, stands in his presence. Nebuchadnezzar says, O Belteshazzar, that was his Babylonian name, master of magicians, <laughs> because I know that the spirit of the holy gods, the Holy Spirit is in you and no secret troubles you, tell me the visions of my dream that I have seen. To Daniel, the meaning of the dream was plain and its significance startled him. He was taken by surprise. And his thoughts troubled him. Seeing Daniel's hesitation and distress, the king expressed sympathy for his servant. He said, let not the dream nor the interpretation thereof trouble thee. My lord, Daniel answered, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. The prophet realized that upon him God had laid the solemn duty of revealing to Nebuchadnezzar the judgment that was to fall upon him because of his pride and arrogance. Then Daniel made known the mandate of the Almighty. The tree that you saw, he said, which grew and was strong, whose height reached into heaven. And the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beast of the field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation. It is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reaches into heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Cut down the tree and destroy it, yet leave the stump of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass in the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beast of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king that they shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall 
wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and give it it to whomsoever he will. And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after that thou shalt have known that the heavens do rule, that God is truly in charge. Daniel, having faithfully interpreted the dream, urged the proud king to repent and turn to God, that by right doing he might avert the threatened calamity. So often God gives us second and third and fourth chances to change, but we ignore his warnings. We experience calamities, disappointments, distress, and maybe even eternal life. O king, the prophet pleaded, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by thy righteousness and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility, thy peacefulness, thy serenity. And for a time, The impression of the warning and the counsel of the prophet was strong upon Nebuchadnezzar. But friends, the heart that is not transformed by the grace of God soon loses the impressions of the Holy Spirit. We no longer listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Self has taken over. Self-indulgence and ambition had not yet been eradicated from the king's heart. And later on, these traits reappeared. That's what happens, friends, when we have not truly surrendered to Christ. We have a form of godliness, but we are denying the power. We look like Christians on the outside. But Ellen White says we are not truly converted. So these traits reappeared in the king's heart, notwithstanding the instruction so graciously given him and the warnings of past experience, Nebuchadnezzar again allowed himself to be controlled by a spirit of jealousy against the kingdoms that were to follow. His rule which had been a great de- to a great degree just and merciful, became oppressive, hardening his heart. He used his God-given talents for self-glorification, exalting himself above God, who had given him life and power. And for months, the judgment of God lingered. Is the Holy Spirit prompting you to make changes in your life, but which you are resisting? God's word tells us that we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Instead of being led to repentance by this forbearance, God's forbearance, The king indulged his pride until he lost confidence in Daniel's interpretation of the dream and made light of his fears. There's no need for him to be afraid. He is the king, the king of Babylon, all-powerful. So God had given the king a year to repent But instead, Nebuchadnezzar walking in his palace and thinking with pride of his power as a ruler and of his success as a builder exclaimed, Isn't this great Babylon that I have built 
for the house of the kingdom of, by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. But it was while the proud boast was yet on the king's lips. A voice from heaven announced that God's appointed time of judgment had come. Upon his ears fell the mandate of Jehovah, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. They shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and give it, it to whomsoever he will. Sure enough, the reasoning powers that God had given him as king was taken away. The judgment that the king thought perfect, the wisdom on which he prided himself was removed. And the once mighty ruler was now a maniac. His hand could no longer hold the scepter. The messages of warning had been unheeded, now stripped of the power his creator had given him and driven from men, Nebuchadnezzar did eat grass as an ox. And his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. So for seven years, Nebuchadnezzar was an astonishment to all his subjects. For seven years, he was humbled before the Lord. But we serve a merciful God. And after seven years, his reasoning power was restored. And looking up in humility to the God of heaven, he recognized the divine hand in his chastisement. And in a public proclamation, a public testimony, he acknowledges his guilt and the great mercy of God in his restoration. Now the once proud monarch had become a humble child of God. The tyrannical overbearing ruler was now a wise and compassionate king. He who had defied and blasphemed the God of heaven now acknowledged the power of the Most High and earnestly sought sought to promote the fear of Jehovah and the happiness of his subjects. Under the rebuke of him who is King of kings and Lord of lords, Nebuchadnezzar had learned at least, at last the lesson which all rulers and all people in power in positions of authority need to learn that true greatness consists in true goodness, humility. He acknowledged God as the living God, saying, I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those who walk in pride he is able to degrade and humiliate. And now God's purpose that the greatest kingdom in the world should show forth his praise was fulfilled. This public proclamation, this public testimony in which Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged the mercy and the goodness and the authority of God was the last act of his life as recorded in sacred history. So we have to believe that Nebuchadnezzar will be the resurrection. What's the lesson for us in this story? Well, it's this. Like Nebuchadnezzar, God sends us his people reminders, warnings. Warnings we should take heed of. We are studying this quarter 
three cosmic messages in our lessons, or the three angels' messages. I think it was lesson five talked about the good news of the judgment. The question was asked in Friday's, that same lesson study, Friday's summary, now that we know that the hour of judgment has come, how does this news impact our daily lives? Is it business as usual? And then there's a question that was asked. If we are honest with ourselves, we will probably say that it doesn't. And therefore, I ask the question, how can we change from an attitude of indifference to one of urgency? Like with Nebuchadnezzar, God's mercy will not last forever. As Seventh day Adventist Christians, we understand, at least we should understand, Jesus' role in the heavenly sanctuary. In the Old Testament, the high priest on the Day of Atonement had to go into the most holy place for the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary. Because of the people's sins, their iniquities, the sanctuary had to be cleansed, which happened only with the blood of animals. In the same way with us, we need a Savior whose life is symbolized by the animal slain on the Day of Atonement as the only way to make it through the judgment. We need Jesus to make it through the judgment. The Israelites were to afflict their souls. This expression indicates that they were to humble themselves examine their hearts, confess their sins, repent, and ask God to cleanse them as the high priest was cleansing the earthly sanctuary. The prophetic chapters of Daniel 7 through 9 and Revelation 14 focus especially on the judgment hour, urgent appeals to prepare. Since 1844, we have been living in the judgment hour. And Revelation's message of the first angel proclaims the hour of his judgment has come. What then are we to do today? How do we today afflict our souls? As once was mentioned earlier, we are to humble ourselves and examine our hearts, confess our sins, repent and ask God to cleanse us, and finally, submit to the will of Jesus, surrender our life to Him. Can we believe Bible prophecy? The answer, of course, is yes, and we know that the Bible can be trusted. God's word is true. It's mathematically precise. It is accurate in all its details. It reveals a precise, it reveals precise dates and the timeline of history, convincing even skeptics, skeptics of its accuracy. Thus, prophecy bolsters our confidence in the trustworthiness of God's word. Friends, the judgment, our message, is an appeal to our hearts. Strive for a deeper commitment to Jesus as Lord of our lives. During this time of the end, God's people should be examining their hearts asking God to forgive their sins and cleanse them from any attitude or practice in their lives, not in harmony with his will. His people will plead with God to cover them 
with the robe of Christ's righteousness. The urgency of the hour is a call for God's people with a renewed fervency to become witnesses. Witnesses to their relatives and friends and neighbors and working associates. The judgment our call is heaven's final message to a sin sick world. A message that will prepare hearts for the coming of Jesus. Friends, the day is coming when the wicked, when those who have not committed or have not surrendered to Christ will be cut down and no hope will be left for them. Probation would have closed. Jesus would have finished his high priestly work in the sanctuary. No mercy will be mingled with their punishment. It shall be destroyed both root and branch. So as we close, I have a final question for you. And it's personal. Because salvation is a personal matter. The question we should all be asking ourselves is, have I fully surrendered my life to Christ? This critical time of earth's history. Friends, as we look around, all that's going on, the frequency and intensity of natural disasters, wars, famines, pestilences. We remember the words of Jesus. It says, when you begin to see these things, Look up, for your redemption draw it nigh. Jesus is coming. We can be sure of that, friends. Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Am I ready? When Jesus leaves the Most Holy, takes off his priestly robes put on the King of Kings and Lord of Lords attire. That means that he has finished his work in the sanctuary. No more forgiveness. No more pleadings. Jesus is ready to come. And those of us who have been faithful to him will be sealed until he shows up. Now is the time for us to be certain that we are ready. I remember, I think it was back in 2011, I was back east then at prayer meeting. And uh, the president of Family Radio, Campen, now late Campen, he's dead, but he had predicted that Jesus would come. And of course, Jesus did not come. So we're sitting there in prayer meeting and people are chuckling and laughing. But over all the noise, I said, what would have happened if Jesus did come? Would he find us ready? It was a quiet. The laughing was over. Friends, this is serious. Jesus is coming. We should not be waiting at the last minute 
to get ready. The only change that will take place when Jesus comes is giving us immortality. We're taking the same characters with us to heaven. So if we are not living that new creation in Christ now, it's highly unlikely that we're going up there. I know that you believe that Jesus is coming. I believe it. My prayer for us today is that we will live as if Jesus is coming. That our lives will reflect that hope in Jesus. That others will see that we are different. We are unique. And that we are not easily led astray. We talked about that this morning in Sabbath school. If our minds are made up for Jesus, then we will become witnesses for him. When he talks about let that light so shine, he is talking about his character being reflected in us and through us so that those around us will not see us but Jesus in us. So friends, this is a serious time for us. I believe the, the lesson we have this quarter is timely. And for those of us who have not yet surrendered to the will of Christ, I urge you to do so today, now, quietly. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and to take control of your life. Because friends, at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Not how good we have been at attending church. Not how many years we've been teaching Sabbath school or going on mission trips or preaching. It all boils down to our relationship with Christ. And if we don't have one, now is a good time to get that going. Jesus loves us. He wants as many of us as would believe on him to be saved. We have that opportunity, friends, not just to make sure that we are ready but when we are ready to go out and help others get ready for the soon coming of Jesus. That's what discipleship is all about. Following Jesus and teaching others how to follow him. We can't be disciple makers if we're not disciples ourselves. So I want to encourage you this morning Submit to Christ. Let him have his way with you. And you will be amazed. At the transformation. That will take place. In your life. Amen.